Hey, everybody, it is Trags once again, and this week on Red Sox Beat with David Ortiz getting into the Hall of Fame and Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds not, I have a very special guest uh, to bring into the show, and that is one Rob Dibble, one of the three nasty boys of the 1990 World Series champion Cincinnati Reds 1990 National League Championship Series MVP, Rob Dibble. He appears uh, weekly on the Rob Dibble show on ESPN 97.9. I got that right, right, Dibbs? You did, yes. I just want to make sure I get all the details in before we jump into the meat <laughs> of the show. Um, anyway, okay, let's, and I told you this right before we started, and I'm going to uh, tell this to our audience. We're going to do the good news, the happy, positive news, and then we're going to rant. So here we go. First of all, David Ortiz gets in. On the first ballot, 58th player ever to get in on the first ballot in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. I don't think it was uh, really, I don't think there was any ever any doubt. Dan Shaughnessy of the Boston Globe, he uh, was a contrarian. He did not vote for him, but I think for the most part, we understand that David Ortiz belongs in the Hall of Fame. Certainly, uh, with all due respect to Edgar Martinez, uh, the greatest designated hitter ever in the history of the game. It was interesting to me um, what Sam Kennedy, the president and CEO of the Red Sox, said, the greatest player ever to wear a Red Sox uniform. But first of all, I want to uh, get into your thoughts on, on what to you uh, David Ortiz meant as a Red Sox player and as a great one of the gr great generational players we've had over the last 25 years. Well, I mean, I absolutely think he's a Hall of Famer, and I, I don't distinguish the difference between the first ballot and the 10th or the 15th back in the day. Um, you're a Hall of Famer, you're always going to be a Hall of Famer. And, you know, really, you know, your peers look at you and say, you know, that guy's royalty. So when, when I look at David Ortiz, I say, you know, he's baseball royalty, uh, a great ambassador for the game because there's a character clause in voting for the Hall of Fame. And, you know, by far statistically, um is deserving of being in the hall of fame so you know and 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 in really respect to sam kennedy he you know probably didn't see ted williams play live because i know i did and i was born in 64 and he was done playing by the time i was born but you know whether it's babe ruth you want to say whether it's uh you know ted williams or carl ustremski it, it all depends on you know what generation of red sox you were watching but i i think in the in the 14 years he played in a red sox uniform you know, besides Pedro Martinez and Manny Ramirez, I, I think by far he was one of the, the most important Red Sox players, um, you know, like you uh, alluded to off the air, you know, by far one of the most clutch players. I, I think guys are defined by how they do in the postseason as well as their regular season statistics. And, right. you know, David, uh, you know, was unbelievable. You know, I mean, and, and play, here's another thing that I kind of look at playing in the American League East during his career by far the toughest division the Yankees were winning championships uh you know they were they were churning out all-star team after all-star team after all-star team Blue Jays were tough Tampa Bay started their run uh of dominance for the last 20 years so you know when you you look at all the teams maybe Baltimore is about the only team and they had some really good players on their teams over the years you know David's playing against one of the toughest divisions in his sport and he's uh you know um, an all-star. So, you know, when, when you look at everything considered, you know, he, he absolutely had the credentials to get into the hall of fame. And I think, you know, the, to, to look at him as an ambassador for the Red Sox and the city of Boston, uh, he, he's been absolutely amazing. And I think Sam Kennedy, and, and, and it's hard to really kill Sam for this. I think he was reaching for hype hyperbole when he says he's the greatest player ever to wear a Red Sox uniform. I will give him this though, and I'll give Kennedy this. I'll give anybody who wants to say that David Ortiz was more than just a great baseball player in a Red Sox uniform. Last week, we had a podcast on Red Sox beat about the five greatest moments in David Ortiz's career moments. Two of them had nothing to do with him swinging a bat. One of them, Right. was his speech in game four of the 2013 World Series, sixth inning, 1-1 game, Red Sox down two games to one in St. Louis. 
and they he rallied the team emotionally, right? They won the next, they won that game, and then they, on Johnny Gomes' three run homer, and then they won the next two. They won the World Series, and the other one goes without saying. After the Boston Marathon bombing, he rallied his city, and to the degree that he represented what Boston was all about. That part of the story has to be told as well when you're talking about David Ortiz, right? Don't Absolutely. you think? Absolutely. I, I mean, listen, like I said, you, you know, uh, as an ambassador, as a kid from the Dominican Republic, um, I, I have a, a bigger place in my heart for Latin American players because I played in Puerto Rico three different winners. Right. Um, I played with plenty of Dominican, Puerto Rican, Mexican players, Venezuelan, you know, Colombian, Cuban, and they bring something different to the table than an American born player. We, we have a wonderful country. Um, we're, we're, you know, it, it's just different. And a lot of these kids come from nothing. So for him to come from Minnesota to Boston, to be as great as he is on the field, but to feel as part of the community as big as he does to make that speech, you know, not a lot of guys would want to step up and, and be the guy. So I'm sure that, you know, taking the microphone and going out there and, and like you said, rallying a city, rallying a country. This is our um, that is, city. That is not the one he was born in. You know, I, I have nothing but the utmost respect for David. I mean, that, that's, that takes some, you know, big cojones. And so for, for me, that's, that's why, I mean, even Pedro and, and, or Schilling or any of these other guys off of those teams, you know, they, they knew that they were playing for more than just, uh, you know, the city of Boston, they're playing for the, you know, the history of the town, you know, 86 years between championships and, you know, the curse of the Bambino and all the other stuff. You know, it's it's a lot of pressure for you to turn that around and then win and then keep winning championships. So, you know, he was a part of that. He was a big part of that. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with Sam Kennedy. I mean, t- one of the top five guys to ever put on a Red Sox uniform. And like you said, and, and a lot of it has nothing to do with baseball. A lot of it has to do with the way you act off the field, uh, the way you treat your, your fellow humans uh, in the community. And, you know, nobody does it better than David Ortiz. And that's, that's one of the reasons why he gets such great respect around baseball and around other sports, you know, and, and, you know, not to get into the other guys that didn't get into the hall of fame. Some of those other guys are not well liked. You brought up, uh, you know, Dan Shaughnessy, Jeff Kent is a guy that I, I absolutely think belongs in the hall of fame, but Jeff Kent's not a nice guy. Jeff Kent, Kent wasn't an ambassador. Jeff Kent didn't like, Right. his peers he didn't like people he, he said i don't want any friends when i leave this game so there's the 180 from david ortiz and so you know when you're talking about statistically who belongs in the hall of fame there's a lot of guys that belong in the hall of fame if you if you throw the character part of being in the baseball hall of fame that's that's mike where i think it gets sticky with bonds and clemens and jeff kent and even Schilling. um you, you know it's it's so that that's a whole nother conversation but as far as david ortiz He's he's an island when it comes to how he lived his life on and off the field. I had the pleasure, obviously, uh, Dibs, of covering uh, David Ortiz for over 20 years and um, well, 15 years. And uh, from the start of his career in Boston to the very end, 2016, the thing that struck me always about David Ortiz is how genuine he was. He would, you would ask him a question, whether in a scrum with cameras rolling and uh, tape recorders going, or just off by himself, he'd always look you in the eye, give you an honest answer. And he, <laughs> and sometimes if he thought your question was uh, crazy or stupid or wh- however you want to term it, like uh, off the beaten path, he give you that half cockeyed look and say, what you talking about, bro? And, and and he would have a way of disarming you and he wouldn't insult you. He wouldn't demean you. That's the word I'm looking for. That takes something special from a superstar who can have the world does have the world at his foot and, and, and his fingertips and the way David Ortiz dealt with me and dealt with others in a genuine manner just adds to what uh, his likability factor in my estimation. 
I, I and I agree with you. I mean, listen, uh, it, it, my my favorite teammates are still my best friends and part right. of my family. <laughs> um, and it, you know, those are guys that you could count on, regardless of what you're doing. You know, in the world, I mean, it's it's so. You know, for David, I think he tried to he tried to lift up his his teammates, lift up his his family, his relatives, and then the community um all by the, his actions and I, I think very few of us can say that we live our lives that way but he's he like you said he's authentic he's genuine um and and at the end of the day I I honestly think he should be separated by guys that played in another era I mean to you know it, it would have been awkward even though uh you know Bonds and Clemens and Schilling and everybody else uh, David Ortiz should be allowed to just go in and not have a distraction of even if it was Pete Rose even if they said hey Pete's eligible oh we'll Pete get Rose to that in, you know, <laughs> yeah you you you'd have fanfare of a different sort for other people so I, I just think that you know with some of the guys that he's going to go in that were voted from the, the veterans committee um, you know, he, by all means deserves to kind of be by himself and, and enjoy his time going in and, and being enshrined. Okay. One more point on David Ortiz. And I want to make this personal for you as a former ace, uh, closer reliever in major league baseball, Joaquin Benoit, put yourselves, put yourself in his shoes as you were many, many times in your career, eighth inning up five, one up one game to nothing in the American league championship series in 2013. What are you thinking when you face David Ortiz? Mind you, Tori Hunter told Joaquin Benoit, whatever you do, when David's up, be careful. What do you do? Well, I, I mean, de depending on if there's anybody on base, um, bases were I, loaded, I, I'm obviously. Not, yes. I'm not, I'm not going to pitch around him. I'm not going to put more guys on base knowing I have a, a cushion to work with. Um, but I'm going to go with my best stuff. And, you know, you know me against lefties, it wasn't always a good fastball. It, it was right. it was sliders yes. over the top, down at your back foot. You know, that's what I'm throwing you if, if I get ahead. So I would work something probably outside because my theory was as hard as I threw Mike, if a guy can hit an opposite field home run off of me, I'm going to tip my hat to you. If I get beat on the inner half with 95 up in the zone, shame on me. I, I should never do that. Yep. And so to me, I would have pounded the strike zone away. Then I would have thrown my best sliders down in the dirt, you know, at his back foot. Yep. And, it, you know, if he hits that, he hits it. So, you know, but you don't intentionally or unintentionally intentionally walk anybody in that situation as a, as a, whether I'm a, a, a setup guy or a closer, I'm not in the in the uh, business of jamming myself up unless, in my mind, you know, was there one out or two outs or was there no outs um, in that situation? Uh, that's a great question. I'm gonna. I I don't want to be wrong, so I I believe there were All two right, let's outs. Let's just say let's just it. say there's one out. There's less than two outs, and I okay. can get a double play if I put if I put David on first base. First of all, he's going to clog up the base paths. So that would also change my decision, you know, but as far as I, my career was concerned against power hitters, um, I, I totally thought I could dominate a power hitter with my stuff. So that's the way I would have approached it. Yeah. I mean, I was careful with everybody, you know, I, I love Tori's comment, but you know, when I'm facing a Daryl strawberry or uh, you know, a Mike Schmidt or a Dale Murphy or anybody, you know, Kevin Mitchell, Barry Bonds, anybody, you know, it, there's, there's, it's not careful to me by, oh, I'm not going to, you know, go with my best stuff. What I'm going to do is go I'm going to be aggressive and I'm, I'm going to dictate the at bat by how I set this person up. I was always, listen, I, I had wonderful teachers like Dave Parker and guys like Buddy Bell, Ken Grippy Sr., Eric Davis, guys like that, that talked about how they set pitchers up. So that's a whole nother uh, you know, psyche that I had going for me. And a lot of the pitchers on the staff did because we, we always, I fed off my, my hitters and I would say, well, what are you doing against this guy that throws like this? What are you doing that? You know, I guess let's let say Todd Worrell was similar to me or somebody like that. And I'm saying, well, what are you doing against Todd? Well, you know, I don't, I don't want him to get to his out pitch. So I'm going to try to hit the right. fastball. That's the best way to hit the curveball. Don't miss the fastball. So that's, 
in their minds, that's David Ortiz. He's thinking, I got to hit Dibble's fastball. I can't let him get to a slider or his curveball. And so knowing that, I'm careful with the fastball. I'm locating it away from him. And then the only thing he's going to see on the inner half is going to be at his feet. See, to me, that's why I have you on. I that that type of insight dibs is is awesome because what it shows is a really good relief picture will talk to the sluggers on his own team or other sluggers on other teams and find out what they're thinking so that he can use it in their, his own arsenal that makes you a 21st century picture in my book um <laughs> David Ortiz, his numbers, just for the record here, 286 lifetime average, but obviously much more than that. The 541 home runs, the uh, obviously the doubles that he had were, were incredible. And he had an OBP of 380 uh, with a slugging of 552. But what impresses me the most, Rob, is what he did in his final year on a bum foot. In, in 2016, he played 151 games. He was very injured, as everybody recalls, at the end of the season as the Red Sox went in um, as a wild card and lost to the Indians. He hit 315 with a 620 slugging percentage, 38 home runs, 48 doubles as a 40 year old on a bad wheel. To me, I, Obviously, the postseason stats with his 17 home runs and his uh, 300 average or uh, yeah, 300 average in the postseason. That's amazing. But what he did in that final year on a bum foot is just beyond the pale. <laughs> Don't you think? Absolutely. And, and the thing about David, like the best hitters that I played against as they got older, if, if their bat speed was a little slower um, if physically they're not going to be able to run around and motor around the bases, which, you know, he was never a speed burner, but he still managed to get doubles and mm -hmm. uh, still would score from first on, on a double. Um, you know, he utilized everything he could, especially with Fenway. Um, you know, I would venture to say a lot of those doubles came hitting it off the left field wall. Um, you know, knowing that, Hey, this guy's going to like, he would say, Hey, this guy's a power guy. He's going to face me away. And, and give himself up to take a double and drive in a run. I mean, the almost 1,800 RBIs to me is that that just shows you that this guy was unselfish. There was a lot of times he probably could have swung and hit over 600 home runs, but he hit the double down the left field line. He hit the double off the left field wall. He hit a gap shot uh, to get in a run or two. That that just shows me the, the pure hitting ability that David had um, and that a lot of players today lack. You know, I mean, I, I remember talking to Hal Morris or Lou Pinella about Don Mattingly and Don knew that, listen, a guy on third with less than two outs, the ground ball, to the shortstop or the second baseman, I get to run in from third. That's unselfish baseball. That's really smart, cerebral baseball. And Ortiz had that. So you don't drive in almost 1800 runs in a career, which has got to be top 10 uh, or maybe even top 20. Um, you know, it, it's very much like one of my favorite all-time players, Hank Aaron. People forget the guy had almost 2,300 RBI. Right. Uh, he, had, he had almost 4,000 hits. You know, I mean, uh, he also stole 230 bases. You know, when somebody is, is a complete player, it may go unrecognized because you're looking at glaring numbers. But the 290 average, and I'll round it up to 290 because 286 in that division is 290 to me, maybe even higher. Um, what he, what he did was, was turn himself from that. I don't know, David Arias guy that came from the twins reinvent himself with the Red Sox. And he did have protection. He had Manny Ramirez in the lineup. He had a lot of great other hitters in the lineup. Um, but you know, he, he made him himself into a professional hitter that depending on the time of game or what it bat in that game. Uh, he was totally focused. I don't, I don't think he ever gave up an at bat in his career. All right. Um, let's get to the less savory part of this podcast. The rant part, Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens belong in the hall of fame. To me, if you want to solve this ridiculousness of the morality clause, which I thought Jason Stark had a great point, you know, baseball writers don't serve as great 
morality police. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he wrote this week um, of The Athletic. And I think he's dead on. The way you solve this, in my estimation, okay, as a uh, professional baseball writers of America writer, the way you solve it is by letting them in, voting them in on their merits, and then on their plaque, indicating what pretenses they were voted in under, what happened in their career, tell the whole story on their plaque, and let people judge for themselves what kind of character they had, good, bad, and indifferent. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, there's, there's this, it's, it's so deep a discussion, but, you know, part of seeing Bud Selig in the hall of fame, Joe Torre, Bobby Cox, Tony La Russa, who managed guys that use steroids um, or performance enhancing drugs. Um, I talked about this on my show yesterday. They didn't outlaw amphetamines, Mike, till 2008. Performance enhancing drugs to me, amphetamines were far more rampant than steroids and i played in the era yes and i know you said this before right yeah to have a commissioner in the hall of fame and these managers in the hall of fame that all benefited from these players um is hypocritical um my wife and i had this discussion because she's a huge red sox fan and she grew up you know watching the era that i played in she made a great point the same writers and the same, like, and I was at ESPN and everybody that followed the McGuire Sosa uh, home run chase that, that Major League Baseball promoted to save the game after this, after the strike. Um, I was the one following Sosa around for ESPN, the, the live look-ins, the break-ins, all that kind of stuff. Everything that helped build the game from the 90s into the 2000s between McGuire, Sosa, Bonds, uh, Clemens, all of these players that are, are not allowed in the Hall of Fame, um, to, to me, you know, it does a disservice to the Hall of Fame. You know, it's a museum. In order to tell the whole uh, factual history of it, you got to have the guy who broke the home run record. You got to have the guy that has the most home runs of all time. You got to have the hit king in Pete Rose. You know, so whatever you want to write as a sidebar plaque or whatever you got to do, that's the way it should be done. And I agree with Jason Stark. So it's not even about morality. It's about history and it's about fairness. Um, you haven't stripped any of the records. Now, to me, I would have more respect for Bud Selig had he not allowed some of the home runs Barry Bonds hit or some of the home runs McGuire Sosa hit, um, you know, because Hank Aaron should be the all-time home run king, you know, in my mind. Absolutely. And so you're doing a disservice to the history of the game by allowing records to stand, uh, you know, have a seven time MVP, which by the way, voted on by the writers, MVP awards, Cy Young awards. So all of this, it's hypocritical to say, well, but you're not going to be in the museum. You know what I'm saying? So you, you could help build the game. You could help revolutionize the game, which many of these guys did, you know, the way Barry hit uh, the way Barry, you know, his on base percentage is unbelievable. Uh, the stolen bases, you know, all of that stuff. And, and to me, here's the thing about, let's just say Barry Bonds. And, and he's truly the best left fielder I ever watched play. Let's just start there. Forget all of the other offensive accolades, everything else. Barry Bonds, bar none, best left fielder I ever saw play. And I had to play against the guy for, for seven years. I was going to um, get to this. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's, it, it, and I don't want to get into the hypocrite. I, I don't want to even, you know, say anything about the name, but how the game was built from 1998 to where it is today, a lot of these men had something to do with it. So to just put a few people in the Hall of Fame like Bud and, and Joe Torrey and all these guys, and I love all of these guys except for Bud, um, it, you know, it, to me it's hypocritical because they, they, they're, they're, you know, Hall of Fame statistics and championships were built on the backs of these other guys that were told it's okay to do what you're doing until 2003. It's okay to use amphetamines until 2008. You know, so all of the abuses that were going on during this time, you know, these people are in the Hall of Fame that were actually condoning it. I think your point about Bud Selig is a good one. And I think a lot of people look at the commissioner of baseball nowadays ever since the day, well, even going back to Bowie Kuhn. And I remember, you know, when he didn't allow the trades uh, with the Oakland A's and, and the Reds and the Red Sox 
uh, fans of those teams back then remember that. Um, it always seems like the commissioner has this disconnect with the actual people who play the sport. And I think, I don't know if that's how you feel about Bud Sealing, but, um, or, or it's just pure hypocrisy that you have, why you have a problem with Bud Sealing. Why is it? Well, I mean, listen, first of all, he's a former owner that they made commissioner. Um, and, and obviously, yes, the owners are the employers and, it, you know, they, they pay for us to play. But at the end of the day, the fans are the game. And to me, the Hall of Fame is about somebody walking through those doors mm -hmm. and going, well, how come this guy's in the Hall of Fame? Right. And how come all these records and bats and uniforms are here? Because I've Great been there point. a dozen times. You know, why is all this stuff here? But these guys' plaques are, are missing. You know, that's, that's you know, I'm, I'm a simple guy, Mike. You know that. And, and to me, to simplify this problem is that, you know, now it's not just writers that have votes. You have bloggers. You have people that don't even go to games. You have people that don't even go and talk to the players and know, you know, like you just brought up David Ortiz and his foot problem. You know, his foot problem was probably there for years. He was probably injecting all kinds of painkillers into it, cortisone, taking stuff, you know, to, to, to get on the field. And, you know, to, to say that one guy taking HGH or another guy taking amphetamines, you know, that I can't separate any of that stuff. You know, I, I had nothing but uh, uh, cortisone shots in my opposite pitching shoulder just to get out there and, and play because I had ruptured my labrum on the other side. So, you know, to me, I, I'm not going to judge people. I allow the people that go into a museum to uh, say, well, that guy's statistics are still valid. He's in the Hall of Fame. That guy's statistics are still valid. Uh, you know, he belongs in the Hall of Fame. And even even the Pete Rose discussion, you know, now we have legalized gambling in this in this country during the World Series. Fox is promoting uh, legalized gambling. But at the same time, a guy that's still and I just saw Pete a month ago, still addicted to gambling, uh, still still yeah, representing I mean, casinos. You know, he's he's not uh, a, a, a element of the of the hall, of the Hall of Fame, which, by the way, and you and I know this. It's not actually connected to Major League Baseball. No, it's not. You know? And that's why when pe I'm yeah. glad you brought this up, because when people say that um, he's banned from Major League Baseball, well, that has nothing to do with a National Baseball Hall of Fame that's not officially connected right. with a Major League Baseball, putting him in their hall it has nothing to do with it whatsoever. Again, it comes down to a, a ridiculous, um, archaic, if I can say arcane, um, yes. morality clause. And if you want to tell the story of, of baseball, professional baseball, which obviously major league baseball is maybe 95% of that, what have you, um, then go ahead and, you know, include a description of their entire career, good and bad, and let it be, and be done with this stupid hip hypocritical, um, approach of not allowing certain players in and allowing other players in when the whole group of them have done something unsavory toward the sport. Let me, let me just bring this up. And, and I know people will be like, well, what does this have to do with the performance enhancing drugs? What if Justin Verlander one day is up for the hall of fame? Are we going to bring up 2017 and what they did with the Astros? Because that's It'd one be of the right. most egregious handles that's ever hit this game. Yet their World Series stands, they enjoy wearing these rings around. A lot of them are, are really arrogant in the way that they, they talk about it, like we did nothing wrong. So I, I, I kind of correlate that to some of these, these performance enhancing drug guys. They're fine. They, they, their records are still standing, which uh, that infuriates me. Um, you know, you had a commissioner that could have balanced the book, so to speak, and didn't. And at the same time, now you're going to have Justin Verlander up for the Hall of Fame, one of his greatest years, uh, traded in the middle of that year. If they don't get Verlander, they don't win that championship. I truly believe that. And so now he's going to be he's going to be eligible to the Hall of Fame, yet they probably won't even bring that up. They'll, they'll be like, just like, oh, you know what? Like that didn't, to me, you can't throw history under the rug. You can't hide it. And I, you know, having played in the era, of and and it's not just the the steroids it's not just the hg the amphetamines were worse worse trust me when i say this um and and to make it seem like that didn't even happen 
that that to me just shows you that people don't know what they're talking about. So if you want the complete history, all of the and and the amphetamines go back to the 40s and 50s. Listen, we absolutely. Even II. Hank Aaron acknowledged yeah, this when he was God God rest his soul absolutely. when he was alive. He he acknowledged the fact oh, yeah. that everybody was doing them. Yeah, and and so for for guys to be more focused, uh, more alert, being able to run faster and and work out and do whatever they're doing you know, uh, the use of a drug, you know, to me, it's like, just stop. Like you just said, you know, stop with the morality, put the right people in there that belong in there because it, it still is a very difficult hall of fame to get into. You know, I'm still bitter about Ron Santo. He, he, he was put in posthumously Buck O'Neill put in posthumously. There's a bunch of other guys that deserve to be in the hall of fame. Listen, we haven't talked about Manny Ramirez yet. We haven't talked about Gary Sheffield, Jeff a -Rod. Kent, A-Rod, Schilling, all of these guys belong to be in the Hall of Fame. But if you want to put something next to it saying, hey, listen, from this date to this date, believe to have done this, what that's up, that's up to the Hall of Fame. That's their museum. You know, the the writers are just the people that are supposed to be promoting the Hall of Fame. They're they're not supposed to be keeping people out of the Hall of Fame. That's the problem I have with the vote today. It, need, it needs to be changed. Baseball didn't lose today. The great fans did. Not having a generation and not having generational players like Clemens and Bonds in Cooperstown is a joke, said and tweeted one Rob Dibble um, yesterday afternoon after the news that, uh, and you're smiling and laughing, and hope I did it justice reading it, uh, after the news that uh, Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens on their 10th shot at the Hall of Fame did not get in. Uh, Dibs, that's why I have you on. Because uh, well, let me stop. Let me stop you, Mike. Let me stop yeah, you. Go ahead. So all of those memories that the, the, my favorite thing when I go back to Cincinnati is when someone says you made these memories for me and my family. Yep. That is the best compliment that I've ever gotten. So all of the memories that helped build ESPN and Fox and TBS and everybody else at MLB.com. Um, all of the memories, all of the history that was made during whatever date to whatever date, you're, you're just going to try to make it seem like the, it didn't happen. And that's what I mean by that tweet. It's not just Clemens and Bonds. I mean, those, those are the guys, the top tier Hall of Fame guys that, that to me, it's, it's not shocking that they're not getting in. Um, but there's a lot of other guys. Rafael Palmero, look at his st statistics unbelievably unquestionably one of the the greatest hitters i ever had to face not in the hall of fame manny ramirez to me best best right-handed hitter for 20 years that ever played this game not in the hall of fame not even close got less percentage of votes than a rod so that that to me there, it, it's far more deep than just a couple of guys there's a lot of guys that that were in this mitchell report uh, that were in the Balco book, the, you know, the game of shadows that were in Jose Canseco's book. There's a lot of these guys, um, that, that were never tested positive And certainly we're told it was okay while they were playing that to me, that, that bothers me the most, you know, it, to not have them in there to explain the history from, you know, 1985 to 2015 to me, I, I mean, you know, that, that's the part of history you can't erase. You faced Barry Bonds, obviously, and you faced him in the 1990 National League Championship Series when you were MVP. What made him unlike any hitter you've ever faced? Uh, first of all, bat speed. Um, best bat speed I've ever faced, you know, and, and whether it was Tony Gwynn or George Brett or anybody like that, they, they had amazing, you know, eyesight, I think, and hand-eye coordination. But Barry's bat speed from this point to that point in getting to the ball was faster than anybody I ever had to face. So my mistakes had to be even less with him. And, you know, Norm Charlton and I, you know, being roommates and discussing having to face him, um, we, we discussed a lot of different options because he's not the kind of guy, if you pitch inside and knock him down, he gets right back up and he does, it, it's like, that doesn't, it's not even a blip in his brain. Now, other guys you could intimidate and knock them away from the plate and, you know, get them on their heels and you could help th that help that one at bat. Every at bat I ever faced him. And uh, I think he hit two home runs off of me. Um, every time I faced him, it, it was it was more about how do I approach that bat speed? Because the guy's choking up two inches on the bat as well. So being as strong 
and and I, I'm all about dexterity. And when I teach my my travel teams hitting, you know, it's as much digging in rice. It's as much grip. It's as much, you know, we do drive line, you know, drills to to work up the dexterity. That guy's hand strength, wrist strength, forearm strength was as amazing as anybody ever played with. And I played with Gary Sheffield, who and Tony Fernandez, who both had some of the biggest, strongest forearms I've ever seen on hitters. To me, Barry was uh, above all of them as far as talent level. So this is what upsets me to diminish how good he was to diminish what he put into his craft. That's, that's what, and I don't even care about the hall of fame, but when people kind of disparage what he did over the course of his career, they didn't have to face him. I did, you know, and, and I, I knew he was, he was a, a level above the best, you know, it's like discussing Tom Brady and other quarterbacks, you know, we do it all the time. Um, and, and so, you know, it's the thought process that goes into it. It's the preparation and then it's the presentation. It's when that guy walks up to the plate, this is it. It's me and him. Nothing else matters right now. And he was that good. And to, to me, and it was the same thing. If he got on first, now I know this is the best bet base dealer that is ever going to be on first base against me. And that, that raises my level of attention to that. And it really takes away from me focusing over here. So it wasn't just that. Whenever you needed a stolen base from Barry, he's gonna he's gonna do that. Whenever you needed him to to win a ball game with his glove, he was going to do that. So I I just it to me, Mike, to diminish this guy's career by not putting him in the Hall of Fame, it just it 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 lacks the belief that this guy was one of the best that ever played. And Roger Clemens, real quick, why why it, does it diminish? I mean obviously this is a red Sox beat podcast and roger clemens you can make the case for pedro martinez but roger clemens over a longer period of time greatest red Sox picture ever and i include babe ruth in that discussion um i just think that roger clemens what he did in the red Sox uniform i don't think we'll ever see again And, and remember it's not just what he's doing the day he pitches the days he doesn't pitch he's helping the other pitchers he's talking to them uh and and you're going over lineups you're you're you know he's helping the catchers call games you know there there's so many little things that can be missed that's what baseball is baseball is sharing of information i i used to always joke about it. it's like you know you see a hitter come back from the plate he's like a little ant he goes over there antennas meet you know, what's this guy throwing, you know, that they tell each other little tidbits of information. So Roger was a living encyclopedia while he played. So he was helping all the other pitchers on the staff, helping the catchers, helping the defenders, you know, so, so Roger is not just pitching, you know, Roger is, is a player coach. And so uh, from the, from the time he was young to the t- time he developed and re reestablished himself in Toronto, developed a fork ball, became one of the most dominant pitchers again, won another Cy Young in Houston. Uh, I think he was 40 or 41. You know, no amount of drug taking is going to make you that special. I I don't care what anybody says. There's a lot of football players in their Hall of Fame that use steroids throughout their careers. I I liken it more to, uh, you know, how how am I going to get on the field? How, How do I get back on the field so I can do what I'm the best at? And, you know, when I, when I look at a lot of the guys in football that did it, it destroyed their lives personally. So many guys have died early wrestlers that have died early. You know, yep. these guys, they, they gave up the unknown for the love of the game. Now, some of it was greed. Some of it was other stuff that I, I can't speak for them, but watching that guy do his thing for 24 years, um, the day he said he was not going to play anymore. I was, I was sad because I respected how well he approached his job and how well he did his job. All right. Uh, RDSmashFactory.com. Tell us about RD Smash Factory. Uh, the Smash Factory is for kids. Um, anybody that's on our travel team, they get a key to the Smash Factory. They can use the machines, the cages. We open up six uh, cages that becomes about 50 yards of turf where you can, um, you know, work out every day. Um, I've got one kid in there, Justin Guerrero from Fairfield. That's not, was the 20th pick of the Mets. Um, he's in there every day. And it, you know, for me, Mike, it's, it's, you know, we open this place 
so these kids can can better themselves. I, I have two kids that I just got to Division three programs. Those are the first kids to go to college from the Smash Factory. Very proud of that. Yeah, and you so should be. That every day, and we do a lot with softball. We have Barb Rinalda is a Hall of Fame coach, coached at Yale for 20 years. Um, one of the greatest pitchers that ever played in softball. She's teaching uh, young young ladies how to play the game. And so what the existence of the Smash Factory uh, in Connecticut, in Oxford, Connecticut, is is not as much about winning as as getting the most out of your your career potential and getting you on to the next level. You are the best, Dibs. I love having you on. You know, I mean, look, you talk about memories like you did a little while ago. I was in the last row. I think I've told you this before, maybe not. I was in the last row of Riverfront on uh, in October 1990 uh, when uh, it was Carmelo Martinez, when uh, Glenn Braggs caught that ball. I was in the last row of Riverfront down the left field line. I remember going, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then uh, he caught the ball and Barry Bonds was on first base. You remember this, right? Obviously. Yeah. And uh, then it was uh, Mike uh, Lavalier striking out. Correct. I got that right. Spanky yeah. struck out to end. Or it, it might've been Don. Slott. No, it was, it was, Don it was Slott. Sluggo. It was uh, Don Slot. Sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, and I remember Barry doing his uh, flips at shortstop. And those are the memories I remember. And, you know, that was before I uh, started my uh, journalism career. And it's something that sticks with me to this day. And I appreciate having you on, Dibs. It's always a pleasure. Well, Mike, I cherish our friendship. And thank you very much for that. I had a front row seat for that. I was yes, warming did. up in the bullpen because <laughs> I owned Carmelo Martinez. And when that ball was hit and I'm watching it go towards Bragsy, I'm going, oh, my God, if that goes over the fence, this is going to get ugly. And, you know, he reached up, he grabbed it, and, and the rest is history. But I'm in the bullpen warming up. And you know the bullpens where they were. Yes. They're right next to right field. So, you know, having to sit there and watch that that close and know that Lou didn't bring me in to face Carmelo – that, that made my heart sink a little bit. But I knew Randy, after he got that out, he was fine. Yes, and indeed they were. And in, we know what happened in the 1990 World Series. Uh, can't wait to see you again down the road soon, sometime soon, either in Connecticut uh, or if you come back this way uh, to this neck of the woods after the Bengals um, complete their remarkable playoff run. I, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to lie. Covering the Bengals right now is something special, Dibs. You'd really appreciate being in the city of Cincinnati, seeing how it's come alive. For Really, I know they went through great times uh, in the last couple of decades, but didn't win a playoff game. This is akin to what you guys went through in 1990. It's very, very similar. It is a special city to win in, and I'm, I'm very happy for those fans. They have, they've been starving for some football uh, greatness and hopefully they could keep it going that is rob dibble the one and only rob dibble you can hear him three to seven every afternoon drive time on the rob dibble show on 97.9 espn in hartford you know they have an antenna as he mentioned in southern massachusetts so you can uh springfield right you can hear him there yes yeah, springfield okay. yep just yep. want to make sure i got it right on twitter please do follow him at rob dibble 49. I want to thank everybody for downloading today's epic baseball Red Sox beat podcast. Thank our terrific guest, Rob Dibble. For Rob Dibble, I'm Mike Petralia, and this has been the Red Sox beat podcast powered by CLNS Media. 